Thanks for coming, everybody. This is going to be uh, it's going to be fun to talk about tonight. Um, we have uh, we have three of us here from the Center for Joint Replacement at Exeter Hospital, and uh, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, shoulder replacement, uh, hip replacement, and knee replacement, and uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, physical therapy uh, um, is uh, is cr critical to the success of each one of these three uh, big operations. So uh, my name is uh, is Tom McGovern, and. Uh, I'm a joint replacement specialist. I do hip replacement and knee replacements. And uh, Dr. Clark is here. He's a shoulder replacement specialist. And then Tommy is here from PT to, to wrap it up and, and talk a little bit about how, uh, how we use physical therapy to achieve the ultimate goals. We'll, have, uh, uh, we'll go through the talks, and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers uh, at the end. So hold your questions to then, and then we'll get to them all. All right. First is Dr. Clark. Thanks, Tom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about really basic stuff like why do people need joint replacements. Um, my background, I am trained in sports medicine and shoulder reconstruction. I, as a sports medicine doctor, I take care of the Seacoast United team. I take care of the U.S. ski team. What does this have to do with shoulder replacements? Well, interestingly enough, a lot of shoulder replacements happen because of something you've done earlier in your life. A lot of athletes, we take care of NFL football players who have hurt their shoulders younger in a younger period in their life. And when I see them when they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, this is their problem and this is what they need. So let's little, talk a little bit about the basics of these joints, hips, knees, and shoulders. They're all ball and socket joints. And the range of motion is really dependent on the morphology or the shape of the joints. Now the, sh the shoulder specifically, I always like to bring up the golf ball uh, t to a tee. It's, it's a, a big ball on a small tee, and what that achieves for us is the shoulder has more range of motion than most joints, which makes it a very challenging joint to operate on, but um, it uh, is a very interesting joint to operate on as well. So the things that most of us have heard about why do people get joint replacements is arthritis, and arthritis is a very basic term. It's uh, multifactorial. 43 million people in the, in the U.S. Um, develop arthritis, and it's not just because uh, your parents gave it to you. You can't always blame them. There are reasons that people get arthritis. One in six people, when you actually break this down, is the number that we see. So this is an epidemic. People think that arthritis is a, joint, is a, a disease of the elderly, and that, is, that couldn't be farther from the truth. There are types of arthritis that, unfortunately, even affect children. So. I'll talk very briefly about these and then we'll specifically talk about the shoulder before Dr. McGovern talks about the hip and the knee. So why is the joint important? We want to have motion in the joint and we want to have, more importantly, pain-free motion in the joint. And usually what we find is that the motion starts to go and then the pain comes in. It can be vice versa at times. The arthritis that most people have heard about is um, osteoarthritis, that's the most common. I'm going to show you right here what we're looking at is a shoulder joint. This is the ball and the socket, so the tee and the ball, the golf ball there. And what I want to draw your attention to is the space between the two joints. So when we see space on an x-ray, it's not floating. What's separating the two bones is cartilage. And cartilage can't be seen on x-ray, so it's represented by space. People have heard of bone on bone, and when we see bone touching bone on x-ray like this, that means the cartilage is worn out. So that's the problem. When the cartilage wears out, this is what it looks like when we put a camera into your joint. So arthroscopically, here's what cartilage looks like, here's what bone looks like. I don't need to tell you that this looks painful because it is painful, right? So. This is an artist's rendition of what it looks like, and it's when all the damage has occurred, and now you don't have friction-free motion in the joint. You lose motion, and it causes pain. So osteoarthritis, which is one of the most common ones that we've heard about, right? It is a wear and tear kind of problem, right? So if you're driving your car, and you drive it 10 miles a day, and that's all you do, this thing will last forever. You drive this 100,000 miles a year, your joints are going to wear out quicker. You've been playing football all your life, or you're an avid tennis player, and I'm specifically to the shoulder, overhead sports, they wear out quicker. Um, I talked about kids. Kids can get arthritis too. Rheumatoid arthritis is not a wear and tear. It's unfortunately when your own body attacks 
the cartilage in your joints from an autoimmune response. But they have the same problems, lack of mobility, pain, and unfortunately sometimes they even need joint replacements much earlier in life. Um, the rheumatoid, the difference is it affects all joints because this, the problem is throughout your whole body. When it's osteoarthritis, it's usually one joint. So there's another reason that you can get um, arthritic change too, and that's from trauma. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you broke something. Um, the continuum usually starts early in life. So if you've torn, if you've dislocated your shoulder, if you tear your rotator cuff, the rotator cuff stabilizes your shoulder. If your shoulder doesn't move in its normal kinematics, it's going to wear out quicker. And the way I describe it to my patients is you have four major muscles in your rotator cuff. And that's just like the lug bolts on your tire. You take two of them away, they're going <coughs> to wobble. Your tire is going to wobble and your tire is going to wear out. And exactly the same thing happens. So when I see a patient who has a rotator cuff tear and they're like, well, you know what, doc, it doesn't really hurt. Do I need to have, really need to have it repaired? Well, the answer is no, you don't have to have it repaired. Nobody has died from a rotator cuff repair uh, tear. But there is a risk that you get arthritic down the road because your shoulder is moving in ways that it shouldn't because it doesn't have the stabilizers. And when that happens, one of the main things is you're, you see this situation where the shoulder, which should be down here, starts to move north because the rotator cuff is gone and it's not holding it in its spot. And then as a result, you have more motion, you lose the cartilage, and you get arthritic. Results are the same. Why it happens can be vastly different. Trauma, this is a little bit straight, pretty straightforward to explain. That ball should be on this bone, right? The ice cream fell off. And when that happens, unfortunately, the blood supply is, just, is completely gone, and we can't do anything other than replace your shoulder. I can put anything you want me, want me to do. to put. I can put it back together. If it doesn't heal because it doesn't have the resources to heal, it's not going to do well. So in these situations, we do replace shoulders because of a fracture or a break. So there are many types of shoulder replacement. Um, the continuum, it can be you know, a very small area that's damaged where you've had a trauma because you fell, you took a big divot out of your shoulder, and we can just replace that little bit. We can put a cap on it, like you see uh, in this region, you can put a whole uh, area where we resurface that. When you move forward and you need to have a shoulder replacement because the socket is arthritic as well, then well, you, took, you replace the ball and the socket. And then when you have no rotator cuff, well, if you don't have a rotator cuff, you can't put a shoulder replacement in because it needs to be stabilized. And that's when we do something called a reverse shoulder replacement. And what that does in a very simple fashion is it changes the muscle balances in your shoulder to use your deltoid muscle to help move your arm. And what we found with that is you get much better range of motion. So there are options for pretty much all these problems that I've shown you. This is one of the first uh, stemless shoulders that was done at Exeter Hospital, and I think it was the first in New England, actually, with excellent um, results so far. So here we are talking about shoulder replacements and what can you do. I would love to say that you could lift your arm like that every time, but the real idea is we want pain relief. The shoulder, again, is one of the most complicated joints in the body. When I replace these joints, I'm honest with my patients. We can get you to sleep through your night. We can get you doing most of your activities of daily living. If you want to serve at 100 miles an hour or increase your drive in golf, it's not the right surgery. Um, function is a whole nother game, you know. Function is something Tommy's going to talk about a little later, but that requires a lot of physical therapy. It's icing on the cake for shoulders. Well, why is it? I mean, you hear people having knee replacements, hip replacements. They're doing everything they want to do. Well, look what the hip can do, right? It goes back and forth doesn't have a lot of motion. Okay, well, let's talk about the knee. Well, the knee goes back and forth. Okay, well, that's great. That's reproducible. Okay, the, the shoulder has infinite numbers of degrees of freedom. For us to be able to reproduce that once we've replaced it is difficult. It requires 70% participation from the patient and the therapist. I've seen patients do everything from play tennis after these to basically, you know, feed themselves, brush their teeth, drink their coffee. And when you have reasonable expectations, it's a great surgery. It's very good at getting rid of pain. But you do not want to expect that you're going to have another 10 years in your, uh, you know, your butterfly stroke. That's not what we do this for. So what is the future for these? Are we going to be replacing everything? Uh, you know, I hope not. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that we are looking into, we have now GPS just like you have in your car. 
it's pretty interesting. We can put these in place looking at your CAT scan during the surgery. We're watching the screws go in. We're watching everything go in live off a CAT scan, knowing that it's in the perfect position. And you know, this continues to evolve. It's um, one, of a gr one of the reasons I love doing this surgery because it's always changing. And you know, we evolved. This is what I used to talk about with my son holding these joint replacements years ago when I first started doing this. <laughs> Things have changed. So um, shoulders continue to evolve, so do we. And I'd like to say we are still on the cutting edge at Exeter Hospital, and we're doing everything that we can to make sure that you're getting the best care here that you could get in Boston or anywhere else for that matter. And uh, I'll turn it over to Tom, to uh, Dr. McGovern, to discuss knees and hips. Well, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Again, we're uh, talking about uh, hip and knee replacement now. And the reason why people get hip or knee replacement is just like Dr. Clark was saying. Most of the time it's for arthritis, osteoarthritis, right? Osteoarthritis is the deterioration of the, the cartilage that coats the ends of the bones. The hip is a ball and socket, right? And the top of the ball is covered with the white shiny cartilage and so is the socket. So when you look at an arthritic hip, you know, it changes the ball and socket so that the cartilage gets thin and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until ultimately it wears out like we saw on the shoulder to bone grinding on bone. <coughs> Changing a hip is replacing the hip ball and socket with a combination of metal and plastic, right? This has been around now for 55 years. Last year in this country it was done over 450,000 times because it works, right? But it's come a long way. When you look at it though, the basic concept is to um, get down to where the ball and socket is, right? And then we remove the ball. Uh, we put a metal socket into the patient socket, and then a plastic liner goes into that socket. And then we replace the ball with a titanium stem with a ball on the end. That's it. Look how easy it is. So it's the big <laughs> deal, right? That's all it is. But it works, right? So this replaces the worn out ball and socket with metal and plastic. This combination has been around in essence since 1962. The materials have changed. In the early days, they were made out of stainless steel and Teflon and, and things that really didn't work so well, but they got a start. Now we have reliable materials that when you look at um, uh, joint replacement, about 95% of them are done with these kind of same materials, titanium and plastic and oftentimes ceramic. Say, so, well, what, you know, a, a big question that everybody has when I come to one of these talks is, well, you know, okay, it's been around a long time and, and we get it, it works and it's done a lot, but really how long does it last, right? It, you know, is it, is it five years or 10 years or 50 years? Well. When you look back at the implants that we did uh, 15 to 20 years ago, they were reliably lasting 15 to 20 years in 85% of folks. So they lasted a long time, even back then, right? You say, what was the wearable part? Well, the wearable part was the plastic, right? The plastic liner inside the cup, just like the tires on your car, could wear out. So back in 2001, <clears throat> the FDA approved a new plastic. You know, plastic. Is a, is a mesh of molecules, carbon and hydrogen, you know, that all link together. And in 2001, a new type of plastic called cross-link plastic was approved by the FDA, right? And they say, well, prior to approval, they test it and see how much better it is than the original plastic. So when we look at it, what they did is they put it in these testing machines, you know, that move it through years and years of, of action, you know, within months, right? And then they measure the wear. The bar on your left is the wear that we were the wear of the what we call the the traditional polyethylene plastic, the stuff that we were using 15 to 20 years ago. That was lasting 15 to 20 years in almost everybody, right? The bar on the right, on your right, is the the amount of wear from the new plastic. So you can see the huge difference. The new plastic wears really at a fraction of the rate of the original plastic. So if the original plastic was lasting over 15, 20 years, we think the new plastic is going to last beyond 30 years. But we don't know, right? <laughs> we don't know because we've only been using it for 15 years. So, so until all the people we operated on this week are sitting around here 25 years from now to see Dr. Clark's son, my replacement, 
then, then you know, uh, we won't know. But right now we have a lot of confidence that these joint replacements are going to last a long time. The second question we get is, well, what about the way we put them in? You know, everybody hears uh, hip, hip replacements last a long time and they work really well. But what about getting them in? How long does it take to recover? You know, there's, there's traditionally the way we've put these implants in is through what we call the posterior, the back, the back approach, right? And it works, and we've been doing it that way for decades, and it really works because the success of the implants is dependent upon getting the parts in right. And so the founding fathers of hip replacement figured out how to get the parts in right through this posterior approach. Unfortunately, to get into the posterior approach, you have to open up some of the muscles. And we're talking about the gluteus muscles, right? Open them up almost like a barn door, do the job, and then sew them back together. And it works. They heal back together, but that takes time. And during that healing time, folks are in a lot of pain, and they're slow, and they're weak, and, uh, and, and they're not recovering like they had hoped. Once it heals, they're doing great, right? So what's happened over the past uh, five or six years is we said, well, what about the front of the hip, right? What we call the anterior, right? In the front of the hip, the muscles go in an up and down direction, almost like curtains, right? Not like a door. So in order to get through the muscles, you can spread them apart. And by spreading them apart, we can still get to the hip joint without detaching the muscles. If we don't detach the muscles, we don't have to sew them back. If we don't sew them back, they don't have to heal. Now, to get into the hip joint through the front is still a huge operation because we still have to get in and do the same job, and that is replace the ball and socket with metal and plastic. But when we, when we go in through this anterior approach, we spread the muscles apart. They're spread somewhat forcefully, right? And we get in, put the parts in, the ball and socket, right? But then the nice thing is at the end of the case, we let the muscles go back to their natural state. So even though they're beat up from the operation, they heal a lot faster because they haven't been detached and sewn back together again. So anterior hip surgery has now uh, been, uh, uh, been um, contributing to a much, much more rapid recovery. We think it probably won't make the parts last any longer, but we're not worried about the parts lasting long. And this more rapid recovery gets people on their feet faster and prevents a lot of those uh, issues that we used to worry about, like getting pneumonia and blood clots and all these things that people get from laying around for a long period of time after surgery. One of the accomplishments uh, in technology that has facilitated this is this machine that looks terrible. It looks like something to punish everybody. This, this is actually the operating table, right? This is the fancy schmancy uh, operating table that we use to do anterior hip surgery. So small technological developments such as this device that holds the leg in a position where we can get to the bones through this window between the curtains has really made a huge difference. And so anterior hip surgery um, is here, and when you hear about people saying, oh, what about that fancy schmancy operating room table? This is what we're talking about. <laughs> what about the knee, right? The knee is another extremely complex joint, really complex. It makes the shoulder look like, uh, you know, a tricycle. The knee has got to move in all different directions as well and hold four to six times the body weight with each step, right? So the amount of force that goes across the knee joint is tremendous, right? So the creator put the, that cartilage padding on the ends of the bones, right, to cushion the ends of the bones with every step, right? But the same condition that affects the hip and the shoulder, osteoarthritis, can affect the knee, right? Again, the knee is made up of the thigh bone, and on the end of the thigh bone is a white shiny cartilage padding. The shin bone on the bottom, again, that's to topped with a nice white shiny uh, cartilage padding, and then, uh, and then the kneecap is in the front, right? Arthritis is a condition where that white shiny cartilage padding, again, deteriorates, right? And uh, when we look at the knee, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we divide it up into three chambers, the outer chamber, the inner chamber, and the front chamber. Almost always when it deteriorates, all three chambers are affected, right? But sometimes not, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. To fix this, right, again, 50 years ago, people said, well, if the problem is this deterioration of the cartilage on the ends of the bones, and we can't put cartilage back on the ends of the bones, why don't we replace it with metal and plastic? It's been working pretty good for hips for the past five years. Let's start it doing it with knees. And so 50 years ago or so, 
came up with a way to put a metal cap on the end of the thigh bone, a metal cap on the top of the shin bone, and then plastic in between. And that's what a hip replacement is. So the concept is the same as the hip. Uh, this is what a knee replacement is. The concept is the same as the hip. We get down, we change the shape of the thigh bone and put a metal cap on that. We change the shape of the shin bone and put a metal cap on that and then plastic in between. Even easier than a hip. How hard can that be? What's the big deal, right? It's a knee replacement. That's what a knee replacement is, okay? And it works, right? Last year in this country, it was done about 700,000 times a year in one year in this country. And you say, well, you know, <clears throat> what could go wrong, right? I mean, the knee is a pretty complicated joint, and not all knees are the same, right? So when we replace these ends of the bones with metal and plastic, it's critical to get the parts on the ends of the bones right, but it's also critical for the part on the end of the thigh bone to match the part on the top of the shin bone in a precise way. And remember, like everybody's legs are a different shape, right? And so well, how, do, know, how do we do this? How do we get the parts on right? Well, over the past five decades, there's been these sets of instruments that we use to put the parts on, right? They're dial gauges, they're, uh, they're uh, um, depth finders, they're uh, you know, uh, goiniometers, all these things to measure angles and thickness and, and, uh, and uh, the, the placement of the parts. About 12 years ago, we started doing computer-assisted surgery. Much like Dr. Clark was talking about, this is a, a GPS system that's in the operating room, right? This is a series of infrared cameras that shine down on the patient's knee. Anything that enters into that field can be seen on the computer in three dimensions, right? So every time we put an instrument into this field, we can measure precisely and not just estimate, oh, I need to take, you know, uh, 3.4 millimeters off. We can see exactly what we're doing. If we want to counterclockwise rotate something 12 degrees, we can actually see it in real time on the computer without using a manual instrument gauge. So this is computer-assisted surgery, and uh, we've been using it for a long time at Exeter Hospital. But the next phase of computer-assisted surgery has come in, and that is to say, what about doing the whole operation on a virtual image of the knee and then using the computer in the operating room? So this is a CT scan, right? A CT scan is a digital image of the knee that can create a three-dimensional image of the knee, right? A three-dimensional image of the knee of that individual knee on the computer, right? With that three-dimensional image, we can do the whole operation on the computer. Test all the parts. Try a size five on the top and a four on the bottom. That doesn't work. Three on the bottom, five on top. Change the thickness, change the orientations, and test it out on the computer on a virtual image. Once we're satisfied with this um, replacement, we use a three-dimensional printer to print a surgical instrument that fits exactly on that patient's knee in the operating room. This is what we call the custom fit knee replacement. So it's to take a, uh, an exact image of the knee and uh, place the parts exactly where we want it on a virtual image and then use an instrument uh, that's created specifically uh, for, that, uh, for that knee in the operating room. Custom fit knee replacement now, uh, uh, we've been doing for a while. We've done uh, well over uh, 1,200 of them. And, uh, and it's the same concept. It's replacing the ends of the bones with metal and plastic, but it gives us more precision and reproducibility. The more precise these implants are placed, they function better, and we think they last a lot longer. So this is... Uh, this is uh, computer-assisted surgery using custom-fit technology. You say, well, what about, you've been hearing about partial knee replacement. Remember I said the knee is divided up into three chambers, the inner chamber, the outer chamber, and the front chamber. 85% of the time when people come in with arthritis, it's in all three chambers, right? But about 15% of the time, it's only on the inner chamber. And it stays that way. It doesn't go to the other chambers. It's a pattern. You know, it's one of those patterns that we see in medicine, right? When folks have just part of their knee involved with arthritis, we have a way to do a partial knee replacement. On your left is a full knee replacement. That's the whole metal cap on the end of the thigh bone, top of the shin bone with plastic. On, the, on your right is a partial knee replacement. Again, it's a much smaller cap designed just to only replace the part of the knee that's worn out, right? The advantages of this are two. One is that it's a much smaller operation, right? And so why get a big operation if you're one of those 
that doesn't need your whole knee replaced, the recovery is much better, faster. But the real reason is the more of your knee you get to keep, the more natural it feels, right? I mean, let's face it, a knee replacement is a mechanical device. It's made by guys in Indiana and New Jersey. It's not made by the creator. And it functions differently. And some people are not satisfied that because it it's, takes away the pain, but it doesn't function like the knee that they had when they were 21 years old. When we replace part of the knee, folks get to keep most of their knee, so it feels much better, right? Partial knee replacement is a technically difficult operation. It's been around for a long time, several decades. But because it's so technically difficult, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't been uh, uh, the operation of choice for a lot of surgeons and a lot of patients because it was so much more reliable to do a full knee replacement. So what's happened in the past you know, five or six years is that just like with the GPS technology, just like with computer-assisted surgery and custom-fit knees, we have ways to do this operation with more precision. And that is a way to put in a partial knee replacement by keeping the rest of the knee and matching the partial knee replacement to the rest of the knee that was uh, uh, placed by the creator. How do we do that? With the robot, right? Just like that. Robotic surgery is here, right? And that's not really what the robot looks like in the operating room. This is what the robot looks like in the operating room. So, not really. I mean, when you think of a robot, right? A robot is really just a, a mechanical arm that is programmed to, to do whatever you want it to do. So this is really what a robot looks like, right? It's a mechanical arm that's trained, uh, that's controlled by the computer, that's trained by a human to do exactly what the human wants the robot to do, right? So in robotic-assisted surgery, the robots look much more like this than the C-3PO. This is what a robotic-assisted surgery unit looks like. Part of the screen, you see those infrared cameras. Those infrared cameras are for the intraoperative GPS-type system. On your left is the robotic arm. Much like those two robots that were playing chess, it's got a programmable arm that only does what the computer wants it to do. And what the computer wants it to do is what the surgeon wants it to do. By that, I mean the same thing. We get a three-dimensional image of the knee through a CT scan. We do the whole operation on the computer. On the computer, we can test the partial knee replacement parts. We can change the parts, put bigger parts on, smaller parts, test it as many times as we want, use some real digital data to see how it's performing with the rest of the knee. And then once we're satisfied with that, um, that uh, uh, reconstruction on a virtual model, that program is, uh, is sent during the operation to the robotic arm. And the robotic arm has a tool on it that helps the surgeon prepare the ends of the bones, right? The surgeon powers the robotic arm, but the robotic arm will not let the surgeon do anything that wasn't in the plan. It stops. If the surgeon starts to go a color outside the lines, <laughs> right, the robot stops, turns off, and doesn't let the surgeon move it anymore. So it's like having a coloring book where you have a crayon that turns on when you're inside the lines and turns off when you start going off the lines and doesn't, doesn't let you move outside the line. So robotic-assisted surgery is a way to accomplish the same thing, and that is uh, prepare the top of the shin bone and the end of the thigh bone for these metal caps, right? Um, but it does it with more precision. But the ultimate result is changing the shape of the end of the thigh bone, putting a metal cap onto it, changing the shape of the top of the shin bone and putting a metal cap onto it, and then, um, and then uh, putting a piece of plastic in between. So that's a partial knee replacement with trying to keep all of the original parts. So, you know, um, we went through a little bit of uh, shoulder replacement, uh, hip replacement, talked, uh, talked about uh, how long they last and, uh, and uh, how we do it now. That's different than before for a faster recovery. We've talked about knee replacement and its success over the past five decades and how we do it now with computer-assisted surgery and robotic surgery. Um, uh, we're going to talk in a few minutes about physical therapy. But one thing we also have to talk about is, as you know, these are big operations and they hurt, right? And so part of the way to get folks through the operation and to, um, and, and to get them through physical therapy is to provide pain medicine, 
right? And these pain medicines are narcotic pain medicines, right? We have a big problem in the world with too many narcotic pain medicines out there. And all the doctors in this state and across the country are saying, we got to watch these narcotics that we prescribe because they end up in the wrong hands. In other words, if they stay in someone's medicine cabinet for too long, somehow they end up in the high school, right? So what we do now, Exeter Hospital has started this huge initiative to get rid of everybody's leftover narcotics from their, from their uh, medicine cabinet. We have these pouches, right? These pouches that you use that you just open them up, dump all the old pills in them, pour some water in, it deactivates them, you can throw them in the garbage, right? So, so we're giving them to all of our patients after surgery. We have thousands of them over at the hospital. If anybody's got some old uh, pills that they want to get rid of, if you stop by my office, we'll give you a bunch of these pouches to take home, get rid of your old pills, and give them to your neighbors to get rid of all the narcotics from the world. Thanks. I'll talk a little bit about physical therapy now. I think we have to tee up Tommy's uh, slides. So my name is Tommy Salarogic. I'm a physical therapist and athletic trainer for Exeter Hospital, and I work over at the uh, Epping Regional Health Center. So I'm an outpatient physical therapist. I'll talk a little more about that as we go through. So what are some of the goals of physical therapy? In general, we always try to decrease your pain, increase your mobility, and in turn, that'll improve function. And then hopefully we see all of you guys doing this. Thumbs up. Happy patients, right? So when does rehab begin? It really begins before your surgery. So prior to surgery, we're trying to maximize your range of motion. We're trying to maximize your strength and then really maximize your overall function as you lead up to surgery. So uh, working on getting stronger, getting that joint, whether it's the shoulder, knee or hip, uh, to move a little bit better because the more motion you have going in, the better. After surgery, um, excuse me, physical therapy starts pretty much day one, right in the hospital. So it leads all the way up to, you know, a couple months after surgery, depending on your goals uh, in particularly. And then of course, we're still always optimizing your overall function. So what are the benefits of physical therapy before surgery? Uh, we have some shorter hospital stays maybe, and then quicker recovery time, that's really a big one, uh, quicker time, to get toward the goals that you set for yourself and that we set together as a team. And then of course it's less cost, maybe less co-pays, uh, things along, that, along those lines. And of course that leads to lots of smiley faces again. So the preoperative rehab, some of the key components, things that we work on are flexibility like I talked about and strengthening. We also work on gait training uh, and that's basically the way you walk. We try to eliminate as many of those bad habits, whether it's a limp or for your shoulder, shrugging your shoulder when you go to lift up. Sometimes we ask people to lift their shoulder up and they think they're getting all the way up there, but they're just tilting like this, you know, that type of thing. And then safety, that's another big one. Um, a lot of times, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, but people tend to overlook safety. You focus so much on your surgery and your recovery that you overlook some of the simple things. So flexibility and strengthening, working a lot on stretching and strengthening, various different exercises, range of motion exercises, gait training, uh, like we talked about using a, an assistive device. Uh, if, you, if you're using a walker, let's say after a hip or a knee replacement, and then if you have stairs in your home, we work on that, that type of thing. So safety begins at home. Like I was saying, you might be really focused on your surgery, or how your recovery is going, how many, you know, how many degrees of motion you have, but your grandchild or grandson left their toy right in the middle of the living room and you're thinking about your motion and you trip on that and that can really be disastrous for you. So we really ask you to focus on the safety at home, take a look at some things, try to prepare before going into surgery, try to make it as safe as possible. All right, so now you're ready for surgery, all that preparation that's gone into it all that mental preparation and hard work, and now the big day is here. So the progression of the post-operative rehab, we talked about it starts in the hospital, and then you receive some physical therapy there, and then typically you'll be discharged to your home once it's safe. Uh, then you're in the home for a little while, you have a physical therapist come to the house 
to help you work on certain things. And once you guys together feel like you're ready for outpatient physical therapy, that's when you travel to an outpatient clinic and see someone like me. So PT in the hospital, it really starts right away, day one, and they work a lot on some of the, um, kind of like the activities of daily living type of thing. There is some light exercise, but it's getting in and out of bed, um, you know, using the restroom, walking with your device, like we said, navigating stairs, if that applies to you in your home. Then when it comes to discharging from the hospital, like I said, the team collaborates to see uh, what the best option would be for you. So if you're safe enough to go home, then that's great, but maybe if you need a little bit more help, you might be discharged to an inpatient rehab facility. You're there for a little while, and then you're ready to go home. So once you're home, you're usually home for a few weeks. And like I said, a physical therapist will come to your house, and you'll work with them in your own home, uh, come up with a plan of some different exercises to be doing on your own, and then you come to the outpatient rehab facility. That length of time varies depending on the patient. It depends on your level of uh, function coming into the outpatient rehab and then your goals that you set for yourself and that we set together and how close you get to them and when you'll achieve them. So outpatient physical therapy, we work on all these different things, range of motion, strengthening, stretching. We use a lot of different manual techniques. With this surgery, a lot of the arthritis type of pain has been eliminated and now you just have some of that surgery pain so we try to you know work you through that and try to get you through that and then really use all these components to maximize your function as far as extra hospital and our outpatient clinics we have clinics all over the area like I said I work in the Epping clinic but you can see how many there are so we we really try to service the whole area and at the end of the day all that hard work all that mental preparation all those PT visits that you went to, all that hard work that you do at home uh, will pay off. You, like uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. McGovern were saying, you know, it's really about eliminating the pain and optimizing your overall function. So you won't have that pain anymore. I can't tell you how many patients have come to me and said, after surgery, they said, I don't have that arthritis pain. I don't have that pain I used to have. My knee still hurts from the surgery, but I know that's gonna go away. And that's kind of the mentality you should have going into it. And also, I do want to mention that the more work you put into it on your own, your home exercise program that your therapist will give you, the, the more you'll get out of it and the better you'll do. We really see that a lot. So that's my spiel. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for coming. Nice job, Tommy. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. we, can, uh, we can take some questions if anybody's got some uh, Something to talk about? Yes, I have more of a comment. I'm retired orthopedic physical therapist. Yeah. I started my training in 1961, which is a long time ago. <laughs> and I had an orthopedic surgeon as a lecturer my senior year who had done his residency in the late 1940s, early 1950s, when there was nothing for uh, hip surgery, for hip fracture patients, except fraction and bed rest. Yeah. They had two clinics. They called one on Mauschwitz and the other one Dachau. <laughs> For a very good reason. Yeah. People would come in in pretty good health, 65, 70, 75 years of age, except for a hip fracture, nothing wrong with them. They'd put them in bed, and six weeks later they'd, they'd bury them. So they all got pneumonia. That's how far we've come. It is a massive massive transition yeah it's incredible I mean even even in the last 20 years that I've been doing this you know when I first started doing this 20 years ago you seen exponential change yeah we used to uh, keep people in the hospital after hip or knee replacement for <coughs> almost two weeks and a good and a good amount of that time was laying around in bed yeah. soaking up morphine mm -hmm. now now most most folks are uh, walking uh, with physical therapy uh, within three hours of the operation Going home, most people go home the next day. How long is the pre-surgery conditioning? Long? Depends on how out of shape someone is. Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, most people go home the next day and um, and then uh, um, and and then begin physical therapy at home and then ultimately transition outpatient therapy. Um, is the custom fit just for the knee, or why is it used on the hip and the shoulder? Is it <coughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the custom fit uh, technology 
is making its way into the uh, into the hip and into the shoulder. Uh, it's uh, you know, these things have to go through the FDA and it takes a really long time and they have to prove that the technology is not only safe but is contributing in a positive way to the uh, outcomes. Um, why was custom fit knee uh, done before the other ones? It might be because of sheer numbers, right? When you look in this country, there are about 700,000 knee replacements done in one year, about 400,000 uh, hip replacements done in one year and about 100,000 shoulders, right? So if you're, if you're the technology development guy, you say, okay, where's the biggest bang for the buck? Let's focus on knees first. And, uh, but uh, hips are in the pipeline and, and so are shoulders. Your slide showed um, hip replacements with metal balls on it. And you mentioned that ceramic is used also. Do you have an opinion about different manufacturers and different art parts that are available? Yeah, so the question is, is there, is there a difference in manufacturers or parts? And, and manufacturers, not really, right? There are four major manufacturers in this country, essentially. They all, they all provide almost identical implants. The surgeons choose which implant to use. I mean, we all choose implants that have a good reputation and have been around for a long time, right? And each company has that. Uh, surgeons mostly choose uh, the company that they use by the instruments that are uh, available to place the parts. Because every surgeon has their own style, their own technique. And like any um, a mechanic knows, certain tools feel better in your hand than other tools. Like you have driven different cars, right? What's the difference between the Ford, the Chevy, and the Buick, essentially? It's the way the layout is, the way it feels. It still gets you from point A to point B reliably if it's a good car, right? So the same thing with orthopedic uh, implants is that uh, most surgeons choose a reliable implant with a good, uh, good history, but really choose it for the, um, the instruments. And instruments change from time to time with companies. So in my career, I've used every implant uh, instrument manufactured with the different companies. And so uh, you choose the ones that fit your style the best. As far as a metal ball versus a ceramic ball, you know, the ball is what articulates with the plastic. Ultimately, the ball will wear out the plastic, right? If that occurs in 20 years, we're happy. If it occurs in 40 years, we're delighted. These days, uh, almost all, better than 95% of the balls that are used in this country are ceramic. The reason is, is because ceramic is much harder and can be much more highly polished so it wears into the plastic a lot slower. So I do ceramic balls. I didn't hear any discussion about length of time for the knee replacement. I've been told 10 years and you're done. No, almost the same. It's almost the same as, as the hip, you know, in that, uh, in that 15 years ago uh, to 20 years ago, 85% of the folks still have their original parts, right? The, the difference is in, that, uh, in the new plastic. The new plastic was introduced in the knee in 2003. So the old plastic was lasting a real long time, and we think the new plastic will last a lot longer, but we've only been using it for less than 15 years now. So the 10 years is not necessarily... Somebody lied to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my insurance customer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for me, it would be hip replacements. Uh, so, are the metal parts attached to the bone by screws? Yeah, so the question is, how do, how do the metal parts attach to the bone in a hip replacement? And the answer is, the, the surface of the titanium metal parts have a roughening to them. And the bone actually grows in to the implant. And that's what we wedge it in at first to hold it in place, and then the, the bone grows into it. Okay. Does that to the bone kind of like a bone break? Kind of like a bone break. So the question is, you know, do you have to let it heal just like a broken bone? And the answer is yes. In those first six weeks after surgery, it's critical to let the, let the bone heal into the implant. That's why I kind of restrict people. I tell them, don't go out and do a bunch of crazy things. You know, just stay home, get some books and some Netflix and some computers and and let it heal. Let the bone grow into the implant. Okay. And, I don't know, you said that you could 
three hours later, people were walking and released the next day. And that would be possible. In other words, without stressing out, in other words, you can still walk around the next day. Yeah. yeah. Most people are walking out of the hospital the next day. Okay. You have to. I mean, in order, in order to go home the next day, yeah. it has to be safe, right? And we consider the basics of safety like this. Folks need to be able to get in and out of bed, in and out of the bathroom, uh, get dressed, and go up and down steps. Mm -hmm. So if folks can do that the day after surgery, they can go home that day, mm -hmm. right? Um, because that, that's what we need to do to be safe at home. If folks can't do that, then they got to sleep over another night and test those things out the next day. Okay, well, my, my situation, I take care of my mother, and I have to, I help her with the walker, help her get out of bed, and do that. So, how, any venture, I guess, of how long, how long time would be before I... Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. Well, but well, let me get someone else first. Anybody else? So, yep. Um, after a hip replacement or a resurfacing, was there a suggested type of mattress to sleep on? Is it a less softer or firmer mattress? Does it matter? Um, I don't think it matters. Which side you sleep on? I don't think it matters. I mean, most of the time after the hip replacement, uh, people don't like to sleep on their side. They're allowed to. I mean, people are allowed to sleep on their side even the night of surgery. It doesn't cause any harm to it. But most people don't, so they just kind of lay in the bed like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and then sooner or later start going side to side. But, I, you know, I think mattress preference probably has a lot to do with everything from backs to hips to shoulders and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. How long for a shoulder replacement? How long does the surgery take? No, how long does it last? So very similar to what Dr. McGovern was saying, the polyethylene that we're using is the same as it's used in the hip and the knee. But when, the problem is when we're looking at when these were first started to be put in, the technology has changed. So what we put in 10, 15 years ago is not what we're putting in now. So it comes back to how you wear the joint, whether you're wearing your God-given joint or where, whether you're wearing a joint replacement. If you're playing tennis with it, you're going to wear it out in 5, 10 years. If you're using it for just your basic, it can last 15, 20 years. That's the, that's the plan. And that's for a total shoulder replacement with plastic on the socket side. I'm looking at cartilage restoration. I've been asking for a number of years, why aren't they putting in some jelly or something there? So you don't have to have a replacement. Why can't they put some something that takes the place of the cartilage? Sounds simple, right? I mean, we should have thought of that. Um, <laughs> dang! How come they're not researching that? Oh, they are. So the problem is they have done that. You're lucky that you weren't one of those people they did it on because it <laughs> failed miserably. So everything that they've tried to put in, we used to call it interpositional arthroplasty. So putting in things that aren't metal and plastic in between the joint, whether it's tissue, fluid, et cetera, it hasn't worked. It has, just doesn't hold up against the forces of the body's joint. Now, we are able to replace isolated areas of cartilage. I mean, we very simply take it from a cadaver. We try to grow it in a, in a lab and put it in. The problem is once it's arthritic the way that we've been showing you, the size of the area that's damaged is not amenable to having one of those procedures done. I would love to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, with my knee that's arthritic, it feels like a ball. Do you scrape that away? Yeah, so the question is, arthritis, do you scrape it away? Remember, arthritis is a deterioration of the cartilage on the ends of the bones. The creator gave you a certain amount of cartilage, and now you have zero, right? So it's bone grinding on bone. So not only do we scrape it away, we take it off completely. In other words, we take off all the cartilage on the ends of the bones and replace it with metal. So all the cartilage is gone. So this, this lump that I feel is, is cartilage. Is 
mostly swelling. It's what? Swelling. Oh. Yeah, inflammation. Yeah. After, oh, eventually after my knee replacement, will I eventually be able to get down on my knees and get onto my computer desk to unplug the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question, right? Is like, uh, can you kneel on a knee replacement? Right? And this is an interesting, uh, interesting answer, right? Because 50% uh, of you're allowed to kneel on it. 50% what? You're allowed to kneel on a knee replacement, but 50% of people do not like to kneel on it. Just because they don't like the way it feels. Even though they're allowed to, they don't like to. And most of the time, if they're going to kneel on it, they don't do it within the first two years. I'm told that uh, there was a surgeon in Portsmouth, and you probably undoubtedly know him, who is pioneering a new technique where each uh, patient's joints are mimicked precisely from the CAT scans and so on that you spoke of, and that the different he's done that he's done 90 operations of this type, and that the difference between that and custom fit is custom fit at the end of the day, you are still picking off the shelf, the ones that are most appropriate, where this man is supposed to be producing something uh, in the shape uh, as like a 3D printer, which gives you exactly the unique uh, part that is yours. What is the difference between custom fit and what is the name of the new process? So the, the, you're talking about a conformist system probably. That's Exactly. And conformist system is another form of custom fit knee. It's essentially the same, but instead of, um, it's got many more um, sizes to choose from. They're still picking them off the shelf. Yes, oh, and I fitting them to your knee. Totally yeah. unique. Yeah, it makes it seem like it's unique. There's more. There's different sizes that uh, that can fit uh, the CT scan uh, better. Is that the way of the future to you? Or? I don't know. It hasn't been shown to be any better. So that's what we all have to wait for, you know, because, you know, we have to, we have to change our approach based on real information and real data. And the, the knees are doing fine, but when we change to a different technique or different style, we have to make sure that it's going to do a better job. And right now, although I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be as good or potentially better, um, that system has only been around now for five years, four or five years. So when we look at joint replacements that's been around for 50 years, we don't want to jump on the first thing that comes down the road because we already have something that works really well. So a lot of us just kind of look at that and say, that's a nice custom fit knee. Um, let's see how it does. And if it proves to be better, we'll do it. If it, if it proves to be the same, then you got to choose which one feels better in our hands. Thank you. Yep. You mentioned in the slide that legs are different shapes, that yep. knees are different shapes, and I, I've also heard that there's a difference between male and female knees mm -hmm. because of the way it's constructed. <coughs> Is that the same that's true for hips? As well? Not really. Not re I mean, the anatomy of the hip is, uh, is different from male to female, but not in a way that changes the, uh, the technical aspects of the part. In other words, there's not male or female parts. Let's get one more back here. Somebody who doesn't have any question, then we'll wrap it up. I'm 71 years old. Yeah. As a young man, I was a paratrooper. And I had around 60 jumps. And you, you land pretty high, especially if you land on a tower rover. And then I went to Vietnam and I carried a 110 pound rucksack in my back for a year. Did either one of those do any damage to my knees? Yeah. So the so the question is, during the service years, which, thanks for your service, and um, did those damage your joints? And the answer is, who knows, right? Because um, osteoarthritis, this deterioration of the cartilage on the ends of the bones, doesn't seem to be directly related, in many cases, to what has happened to that body during the years. In other words, you'll have professional football players who can never get arthritis, who never get arthritis. And, and you have uh, little, little uh, uh, couch potatoes who never do a thing in their life that get arthritis, right? So most of our understanding of why this cartilage begins to deteriorate 
is that there's some uh, biochemical change within the joint that causes a softening of the cartilage. And that biochemical change is likely something that's genetically programmed in us. That's why, that's why anywhere from 38 to 51 million Americans have it, but not 300 million Americans, because it's likely something in our DNA. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. We'll be up here for a little bit.